आपने 90s में बॉलीवुड मूवीज देखी है तो उसमें हमेशा एक कैरेक्टर होता था हु यूज टू बी फ्रॉम अ रिच फैमिली और उसका एक डायलॉग होता था क्लीशे डायलॉग मुझे एक जरूरी मीटिंग में जाना है एंड देन यूज टू एक्सेट द सीन सो टुडे सदफ सेट द सेम थिंग टू मी इन द मॉर्निंग सो ही वोट बी हेयर फॉर दिस रिकॉर्डिंग बट बट वी हैव एलिजबेथ ऑन द शो नॉट द क्वीन ऑल दो शी वु मेड फॉर इंटरेस्टिंग गेस्ट बट टू लेट आर आई पी वी हैव एलिजबेथ योक Elizabeth welcome to the show. Hi Arch it's really great to be here. Happy to have you here. So Elizabeth is the founder of two very cool ventures one saving grains a food upcycling initiative and second edible issues which is an online publication about the indian food system and elizabeth will tell us more about this so elizabeth before you tell us about these two cool ventures what did you do before starting them so i am a cook by profession i went to manipal so waksha was the school where i went to train in culinary arts and i worked in restaurant and hotel kitchens for about 6 years post that post starting edible issues and saving grains yeah i think that kind of very briefly so i'm a cook by profession but i think my curiosity and interest in the food system has allowed me to have like various opportunities to learn new things and do very interesting projects so even while i was cooking I got to attend I was a grantee for the math symposium in Copenhagen and I got to go to that and the Oxford symposium or working in Mexico City and doing a program there and I think food has always kept me there's always been something more curious to learn about food also I think the thought started with because what happens to food before it enters and after it exits the kitchen whether where does it come from and where does it go whether it's waste or customer reaction so I think so many questions that i've just kept asking has led me from one thing to the other lovely what were these symposiums about were the academic symposiums on a particular topic related to food so i think the math symposium in copenhagen i think the new york times called it this global basically this global conference for food the idea of it being that chefs restaurateurs a lot of people in hospitality also non hospitality folk working in the food space come and congregate together there are talks networking opportunities the idea is to basically be able to provoke thought on what's currently happening and kind of build a new understanding within the food space so i think for me being there i interacted with museum curators who were working on displaying pasta shapes so a butcher from italy who basically broke down a whole animal right on stage as well as talking to other colleagues and just getting a more global perspective of what's happening in food and what are the potentials that are to do things the oxford symposium was more academic but that was another approach to food that i wasn't had been exposed to yet there's so much happening in the research space also in india that uh, sometimes i mean not sometimes we do work in very siloed spaces so opportunities like this definitely allow for that inter exchange of thoughts and ideas which is really great yeah super i noticed that you call yourself a cook and not a chef <laughs> is that deliberate what's up with that i think after culinary school i don't know like the chef seems more i guess a more authoritative not authoritative i feel like you know it's it's just like working up to a title and although right. i was in a place where i was kind of i was working in a kitchen that i was partially also like co running i was a, a sous chef but i think that you have so many people working in a kitchen and from different faces whether they're trained they're not trained and the beauty of that is everybody comes there with knowledge of their own and the chef uh, which is like the whole tier system kind of creates that authority authoritative structure which sometimes then doesn't allow for like uh, better sharing you do obviously need someone in charge but at the end of the day like when it comes to knowledge of food i think we're all cooks it is because of the knowledge we bring to the table so i think i found kitchens to be such amazing spaces to learn so our kitchen boys when i was cooking at one point of time like we'd bring in new ingredients and they'd be like oh yeah we used to grow this variety back home and uh, before they moved to the city to work as cooks and they'll be like this is how it's grown here look at some pictures my family sent me today this is what we cook with it or like we'd have extra materials extra ingredients lying around and they're like i know what we can make or i know what to do with tomato skins and there's so much like knowledge that exists 
And I think I feel Cook makes it a more equalizer in that sense. That makes sense. I asked this particularly because I recently finished uh, watching this show called The Bear. For mm-hmm. our audience, the show is about this uh, chef in a fine dining restaurant in New York, one of the top restaurants in the world. He unfortunately has to quit his job there and go back to his rundown family Delhi and sort of revamp it. So there he brings in new systems and one system is that everybody, irrespective of their hierarchy, has to call each other chef. So everybody has to answer to each other as yes, chef, no chef. So I highly recommend the show. Have you watched it, Elizabeth? I haven't yet. I've had so many people asking me (laughs) and I just haven't had like, I haven't been able to just sit down and watch it because I hear it's like really, really good. Yeah. No, I haven't yet. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. But also like, I think that it's an interesting conversation like cooks and chefs because I think recently there was a big like debate that I don't know whether it was on Instagram or Twitter, probably Twitter, because there's always some angry things going on there. But it's like, who can be called a chef? If you cook at home, you know, you can't be called a chef. You Mm. don't hold that title. And I think that like, it's so, or like, for example, even with me, after leaving the kitchen, there was like such a, you know, can I be called a, a, what do I call myself now that I don't work in a professional kitchen anymore? Am I still allowed to be called a cook? a formal cook and I don't know because that's my whole grounding and foundation but for a lot of people it was interesting because they were like "Mm, technically you aren't part of this profession anymore and so that's it you can be because I have my kitchen space I am cooking but I feel like people try to I mean I guess this is with everything but it's an interesting conversation (laughs) yeah yeah let's come briefly to edible issues now I'm gonna play devil's advocate there are lots of food publications online. Anybody now can be a food writer and post about food. What differentiates edible issues from other publications, in your opinion? Right. So interestingly, we actually don't, we try not to call ourselves a publication. Um, And I'll give you a little context of how we also started. So one of my like curiosities about food uh, led me to the Future Foods Institute's Food Innovation Program, where I was a research fellow in 2018. Mm-hmm. And that's where I met my colleague and now very good friend, Anusha Murthy, who is co-founder at Edible Issues. I have and, to pause you there. Sorry. Yes. Can you tell us more about this fellowship? Okay. Yeah. So this was one of probably the most, the coolest experiences <laughs> um, yeah. that today I yeah, had. And one of the reasons, so there was this program, called, it's called the Future Food Institute, and it's based out of Bologna in Italy Mm -hmm. and they ran this program called the food innovation program where they brought together 15 professionals in food so not necessarily in food but 15 professionals very like mostly in food but also eager to learn more about the food space and contribute so we had lawyers we had designers we had engineers we had cooks chefs we had food scientists and so we all came together in this little town called Reggio Media and we together went through this one year program that involved different phases and different kinds of research and learning within food but looking at the global food system so the first phase was for about three months we kind of learned about what are the current innovations happening and we actually got to meet and work with people in the current food space that were working on and researching current like topics. So for example, Mark Post who developed the cultured meat burger. Uh, he was one of our professors and he actually took us to the lab and showed us like how very briefly and so like not even like skimming the surface even less than that, but basically how you can grow cells, meat cells. Or we learned from Professor Daniela Berile who is researching on dairy at UC Davis about, you know, new innovations and research that was happening in that space. And current like technologies that have been used by Google. So it was a fabulous, ex- that first part of it. The second part, which is the highlight of the program, I think, was to travel to about 10 different countries across the world. So right from wow. Shanghai to the US to Europe and Asia as well. And we were divided. We had like four different topics in food. Mine was circular food systems and sustainability and circular food systems. And Anusha as my partner was the future of protein. And we also had the future of food service and food and agri innovations in smart cities. So we had these four themes and we went and interviewed about 160 people uh, that were working on a, either intergovernmental level or on uh, an individual level 
for me, it was to understand what a circular system and what a sustainable system and a business model was to them and what were these kind of different versions that were uh, happening across the world. And similar, the other topics had those kind of different research trajectories with their uh, spaces. And so that was really interesting because you got to not just meet people, but like learn about food cultures beyond you know actually be there and understand on the ground what was going on and yeah and just like immerse yourself for this was this was a two and a half month trip and yeah and the last phase was a design thinking innovation phase where we got to work with companies in Italy through basically trying to through the design thinking process trying to um, put together basically solve a challenge for them so yeah so that was that was kind of program which was really exciting and I think gave a lot of perspective to much of the work that I'm doing today so at the program in the first week second week of the program we were learning we were talking about plant we were talking about cultured meat plant-based meat sustainability like all of these circular economy these big words and Anusha and I because we were the only two Indians in the batch we looked at each other and we were like plant-based but what does this mean for a country with like such a large culinary repertoire already or you know like what does sustainability mean or circular economy principles mean when it translates on the ground to a very localized system that already has good practices? So what do these things do back home in in India? What do these innovations mean back home? And so with that thought, we were also asked the question of where do you go to learn about the Indian food system? And I think because Anusha, she is an engineer by profession and also a marketing professional. And I was a chef cook. Um, I'm not saying chef. I'm not, but I was a cook, chef, chef cook. I think that like uh, we, we were like, okay, we're doing things in our own little bubbles. But maybe if we just shared some of that knowledge, we can help each other figure out the issues we have. And so what we did was we started curating. We said the first step to this process is to understand what's happening because also back we are so far away how do we keep up with what's happening back home for this entire year so we started like picking out like through maybe about 100 articles a week trying to decipher trying to understand what was happening in the Indian food system and uh, we curated that into a newsletter and so that's how we started edible issues on this same research trip India Bombay was one of the locations of our research project so we ended up here and we hosted our first ever edible issues conversation at the Bombay canteen and we had Dr. Kurush Dalal we had Varun Deshpande from the Good Food Institute we had Sara Roversi from the Future Food Institute and we had um, Chef Thomas who was at the time at the Bombay canteen and we had like a panel discussion and a conversation that was part of their canteen class and I think just the response to that and the things that we were able to put together curate or stitch together was really motivating and from then we do public engagement activities we do research dives we have the newsletter that happens the idea is just to kind of keep up with the Indian food system to try to share as much as we can or learn as much as we can even though it's outside our silos bring people together create these networks and connections and we do these in very very different formats from offline to online and yeah and through the newsletter so lovely from a publication I think we're calling ourselves a collective that fosters thought on the Indian food system but yeah I think that's very much open to like iteration and building so there's so much more to do you know I'm wondering if there's a word for being envious, but also really <laughs> happy for someone. Because I feel feel like that right now. Because you've lived the dream of a food geek, like going to these symposiums and these fellowships. Absolutely amazing. And I mean, yeah, you worked hard for it. So I'm not saying you've lived the dream on luck. So no, but yeah. I mean, I do owe a lot, but I think I feel like you're just in the right. Sometimes these things happen. You're just in the right place at the right time for the next opportunity. And I I mean, there's there's a lot of at least serendipity that goes around behind it. But yeah, I'm extremely like lucky to have gotten these opportunities and to be able to do these things. So yeah, it's been food geek. That's for sure. (laughs) The ultimate food geek. So (laughs) let's jump on to your uh, second initiative called, I mean, second, because we're talking about second in the podcast doesn't have to be your second initiative. But let's talk about saving grains. Now, I recently was having a conversation with somebody who's run restaurants in some of the top hotels in India. And I'm asking Mm -hmm. him about what happens to buffets because we know buffets, the quantity of the food 
uh, made is a lot and there's obviously mm-hmm. the quantity is more than what is consumed so there is a lot left after so I, logically it would make sense to give it away to a, to the poor or to give it away to uh, an initiative who is uh, an initiative which is acting as an intermediary between excess food and people who need uh, food but to my surprise he told me that they don't do that they throw away all the food from the buffet and i was shocked and then he told me why and it made sense to me he told me that no restaurant or no large food chain or hotel would want the liability of that food because just in case out of 1000 food packets or 1000 uh, units of food that you give away to somebody even if one causes a kind of sickness or leads to somebody's death and the hotel chain will be liable so just for that mm. liability they don't give away the food for they won't give away the food and save the food instead of throwing it away so it was fascinating yeah. and i want to start by asking you is there a solution to this particular problem i love talking about like food waste yeah. um so i also work uh, as a food waste consultant okay. and i've like i've been working with i think my first interaction as a professional on my first internship in a hotel my first job was to take the at like to close the buffet in the morning for the breakfast so i take those croissant and all the other baked goods and basically put it in the bin and oh. that was my job that was my first job uh, that and i was Did so scandalized yeah. like yeah. i was so broken like yeah. after that first internship oh, no. and i was like is this really what i'm going to do like and obviously I, that was only for a week and i moved on but same that's when i first had like the first day i think i went to the executive chef and i'm like i don't think i can do this this is my first year of college also and it was really shocking like i'd never right. done i mean you see hungry people everywhere right yeah. and for me it was not just that like you were looking at ellen wire butter made in france that has been flown in to make these croissants or you had these chefs who were so talented and skilled investing their time and energy to make this their time was being thrown in the bin so not just you had like wasting food but you had people's energy and you had money like actually you're throwing money in the bin and so that point was actually the start of like a lot of the things that i also do today and why i do like whether it's saving greens or working as a food waste consultant so i work with this initiative called the pledge on food waste which is basically a platform that helps restaurants and hotels reduce their food waste and what's very interesting about the work that they've done and what they've seen and the data they've captured is that only maybe a, the assumption is that majority of the waste happens at the buffet when actually that's not true so if you oh. think there's a lot of waste that happens at the buffet that there's maybe double the amount of time a waste that happens before through either inventory or through prep and so that's another reason why I work with these people so we can solve that issue as well of better management of resource that's one like assumption does happen what so can you imagine like there's so much waste happening in a food establishment that is yeah. gone unchecked and another like place where people feel like like chefs feel like they're not wasting is because they don't measure their food waste which is another issue like if we started actually calculating and we had data we can actually see how much we are wasting but what's for me in this whole food waste conversation the most i guess this would also fall in the pet category but i may have to like answer it i mean now but you have people justifying so the argument is that oh it's okay for me to waste because anyways we're donating it or we can donate it uh, so the conversation of hunger being correlated with like access and like wastage it's this a vicious cycle because unless yeah. we tackle the fact that you know we need to prep hungry people should not be reliant on us preparing extra right we shouldn't create that system where hungry people is an access problem and is you know and a lot of other issues that are there because we have hungry people it doesn't mean we can support with excess food but it shouldn't become an excuse for us to keep making more because there are hungry people so i feel like that's something that we need that cycle is something we need to break so we look at prevention versus post food waste creation like trying to solving distribution post food waste creation so i think that's something that 
it, to your question is that that's how we solve this question. I mean, if buffets are not working, there are a lot of solutions. If we're creating excess food waste through buffets, there are a lot of solutions to pivot to a different model and to then also save money because then you're not binning food. And also to look at different, and so many hotels and restaurants have actually done this very effectively. Or like doing simple changes, like changing the size of a plate so that even encourages how much people eat or changing the size of portions. There's a lot of like... Uh, solutions for things like this but yeah I, I think that like focusing on prevention versus figuring out like distribution you know post waste is the solution to this food waste problem at least in restaurants and hotels got it and what do you do at saving grains that contributes towards improving the situation so i would say saving grains is a little different from when we talk about like the food waste uh, issue in restaurants and hotels today it's more of I wouldn't say it's a waste. I would still call it a byproduct of okay. the brewing process. Mm-hmm. Only because one is that the connotation of waste is is there is this obviously a very negative connotation of waste. And right, secondly, yeah. it's not something that's been like is cooked for an edible purpose that needs to be then redistributed. So basically what we do at Saving Grains is we upcycle brewer spent grain. And brewer spent grain is the byproduct of the brewing process, which is mostly made out of malted barley and wheat and other grains as well, if the brewer chooses to brew with those grains. And basically what happens in the brewing process is that malted barley and wheat is soaked in hot water and then the carbohydrates come out and the sugars come out into that water and that water basically then gets fermented and becomes beer. And you're left with this mash of protein and fiber and a little bit of carbohydrates that is usually basically what's left over. And that's mash is spent of its carbohydrates and that's why it's called spent grain. So we basically pick that up. We process it into flour and we use it to make different products. And that's kind of the essence of what we do with the byproduct of yeah breweries. So before you were doing the what was happening to the byproduct, what was happening to the spent grain? Right. So... We're not used to having breweries in our cities. I mean, this is like maybe a decade or maybe two that we have breweries within our cities. Uh, Usually breweries are located in peri-urban areas. So what that does is that it's easy access for farmers to come and pick up the spent grain as cattle feed. It's phenomenally great as cattle feed. I think there's some research reports and that say that it's increased the milk one and a half times if i'm not mistaken and because of its fiber and protein content it's really good so to give you an idea the spent grain that we've measured out has about 46 percent fiber 23 percent protein and less than 0.1 percent gluten wow yeah (laughs) so it's like that's amazing the only reason i'm not screaming protein protein from the rooftops is because i think there's a lot of due diligence that has to be done first uh, to identify how the body metabolizes this protein yeah but i think that it's a great from whatever i've read like from whatever research has been published online it sounds like a really great nutritious plant source Uh, yeah so basically yeah what used to happen was that it used to go as cattle feed What happens within our city, I work within Bangalore and uh, getting one kilometer anywhere is probably a challenge. So can you (laughs) imagine uh, uh, a farmer having to like drive his tractor right all the way into the city to pick up also a very insignificant amount of grain probably. It's not worth it. So that's one issue. Then we also have issues. It's so it becomes easier for the brewery to like either give it away to the BPMP. Some breweries are more responsible than others and have set systems in which they do make sure that their spent grain is either being given to a cattle farmer. Yeah, there are proper systems in place. But others, it's just easier for the quantities that they brew to dispose it to the municipality. But for me, what's more interesting about this is that we're looking at a grain that's being produced in a way in our cities. So, you know, we're talking about urban agriculture and and all of these things. But like this grain is literally being, even though it's a byproduct, it's being produced as this higher fiber protein flour right grain right here. If we can even take away maybe 0.01% of stress from the land and we're able to consume this within our city as well, I feel like that could potentially make some amount of difference 
to the way we just look at byproduct and the way we consume and to whether it's for communities or diets or nourishing or whatever or whatnot. But it's here, like there is a food source that's available within our city. So why shouldn't we take part in it in this way? Fantastic. I'm genuinely surprised, presently surprised by the nutrition numbers that you shared. And of course, as you said, we have to check the bioavailability of the protein. But that's, that's amazing. So are these breweries just um, micro breweries in Bangalore or are they like large scale breweries which make bottled beer as well? So the breweries that I work with, my focus is on micro breweries. Okay. Just because the larger breweries that like brew for, as you said, have much larger plants are located in areas where they already have systems just because of the sheer volume. So to give you an idea, Mm -hmm. per batch, a microbrewery would brew for a thousand liters. They'd Mm -hmm. use about 200 kilos of grain. So usually you'd brew about, I guess, from what I've understood uh, from brewery owners that they brew about, uh, say, a thousand liters a day, which is about 200 kilos say potentially of spent grain a day Mm -hmm. and we have about 70 microbreweries in Bangalore city so that's Mm -hmm. about 14,000 kgs Mm -hmm. of like potentially good grain yeah and so the idea is that can we first capture on this and also because these microbreweries their focus on grain quality and things like that is different from like a larger brewery so like there are a lot of these different kinds of like things to look at but so right now I we're only focusing on city-based smaller like breweries got it that makes sense and what all products can you actually make uh, with spent grain so i did say about the nutrition factor of things yeah. but actually what's really interesting and what really got me into spent grain was the flavor oh. so this is a bit of a story but like yeah. so i did an internship with a bread historian in i think 2016 and we were recreating breads from the 13th and 14th century bread historian is- he was so cool. His name is William Rubel. Okay. Uh, he's based out of Santa Cruz in California. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think I was going through a bread phase. Um, and I just, <laughs> we were making, I used to work in a restaurant just to have a breakfast menu and we were making a lot of like sourdough and uh-huh. things like that. And, you know, we couldn't get like the tarty in style kind of, you know, the beautiful holes, you know, because we were a yeah. hot kitchen and we were a tiny kitchen. And it was like really hard to also then long slow ferment without things getting sour extra extra sour and uh, stuff like that and so I was like okay I'm gonna do this internship and figure out like you know how to make good bread like better bread and through this internship actually it was when I realized that one of the things we were referencing to had mentioned that brewers and bakers worked in similar spaces because same like uh, in the same vicinity because they shared common ingredients so grain water and yeast and what was more interesting than that was that whatever was left over so whatever the baker if they had he had extra they had extra bread it would be given to the brewer that would be fermented into beer so there's this very cool company in the uk called toastale that's actually making beer from leftover bread and then similarly the brewer would give the baker leftover grain and yeast to cook with bake with only because flour was a very expensive commodity and the spent grain helped like bulk up things so it's like circular exactly so today you would in today's language you would call it a closed loop circular system and all of that but yeah so technically it did exist uh, for economical reasons mostly i'm yeah and just for general like good practice and yeah and so when when i came back here we started using some of the spent grain and the spent yeast to make bread and what we realized was that the flavor was i mean why do we make sourdough was one question we wanted to slow ferment but we want flavor and this gave like enormous amounts of flavor for the little amount that we had to add in Mm -hmm. and then we could still slow ferment and auto lease and all of that but like there was something really like wholesome about what you know this byproduct and I think then through that food innovation program and what we learned and that also that inspiration I mean kind of helped kick off building this saving grains model that we have going today which brings me to I forgot what you asked in the first Um, place and I told you my story (laughs) oh see I told you I'm terrible no no I, I love that I mean I was just joking with Sadaf the other day that 
uh, our podcast is more about rabbit holes than about ac- the actual topic. So I love rabbit holes. I actually asked, what can you make with uh, spent cream? Yeah, anything, everything. So this Diwali, in fact, no, we are running. Um, so I started off with bread yeah. because I felt like flour means the easiest medium for me to incorporate. And then obviously you can do any like bread based flour based you can work with it within any flour based uh, recipe but because it has 45 percent fiber mm-hmm. you can't if it's a flour forward like flour first recipe you can't really use it in 100 percent only because you'd be eating cardboard so imagine like a 40 50 percent fiber like bread it's super dense and okay. it like it, you can't really it's not very like edible and I don't think our body also needs that much fiber. So we use it as in like between 30 to 40% in whether it's breads or things like that with uh, you can make brownies and cookies and cakes and all of that. And with products with uh, larger, with more enriching agents like brownies, which has butter and like all sorts of um, uh, with chocolate and uh, other things there, we can use a hundred percent spent grain flour because the proportion of flour to the main uh, ingredients is much lesser. So then it's great and it works well like that. We also make granola from the whole spent grain, which is quite tasty. And uh, we do biscuits and we're experimenting with some pasta uh, at the moment. But for me, what's the most interesting part about all this in the last few months has been because we are a community centered approach means we're trying to see how people can contribute more and you know what does it mean for people to actually be using this product and so we have a uh, Kaki, who's within our space, who tasted the flour, smelled the flour once and said, oh, this reminds me of Jola the Roti. So we're like, okay, let's make chapatis. And they turn out delicious. So that's our daily bread. We can use 30% of it and make chapatis and they're absolutely great. And this festive season, we're actually making laddus, chikki and halwa from the spent grain using 30 wow. to 40% spent grain. So that's been like really exciting. I'm just tooting my own horn, but the laddus are so delicious. <laughs> they are. <laughs> but like each time we make something new with it, I'm so surprised. And I think that's, I mean, I'm not, I'm surprised, but I'm also like, it's such a great motivator to be like, this is a good tasting product first. And, you know, it can be used in such like, exciting ways in in everything so it's so versatile in that way we just have to play around and tweak existing recipes to include it whether you're looking for like nutritional stuff to balance it out or you're just looking for flavor you know and like yeah it's great fun to play around with that <laughs> lovely and where can we order it so we have a website we have saving grains.in forward slash shop so um, we link it in the, the show website. notes yeah okay. lovely is there something like this happening globally or is this yeah, yeah sorry Go. yeah no 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 i, I, I see the excitement like... <laughs> on your face and i want to stop and sorry yeah no no no. i love that yeah go ahead the the global ecosystem for mm. spent grain is so exciting like there's mm. so much happening uh you have regrained which has got like some crazy amount of investment recently and they're building all sorts of exciting things. They started off with a granola bar, making granola bar from upcycled brewer spent grain. And now they're like, they're doing so many collaborations. They're everywhere and they're doing lots of exciting things. There's also like people making crackers. We also make pet treats from the spent grain, by the way, I forgot. So people and pets. Uh, but they're also, yeah, we oh. make little like dog biscuits for, yeah. So those turn out pretty good as well. But their company is also doing stuff for, for like uh, for as pet treats, as crackers, cookies, just a flour. So I think the global ecosystem for upcycled foods in general is really great. There's this association called the Upcycle Food Association, which is certifying brands to show that they are really upcycling foods and not, you know, saying that it is byproduct and then using it or like other small things. So they're a great organization to look up if anyone is curious about like, you know, learning more about what upcycling is, what can be considered an upcycled food product or yeah and they have all of their brands like listed uh, certified brands listed there yeah some really exciting stuff happening superb what's your long-term vision for the enterprise is it to expand the products that you're selling or upcycle more grains more food items definitely so very ideally i'd (laughs) love to do everything and all things and i feel like 
there's so much potential in like all of these food byproducts for flavor and just for like innovation and i think a lot of our chefs have that now and i feel like this is such a this is like a space that's just waiting to be tapped into but i think for saving grains our goal as we said so we are a community centered initiative is what we're trying to build around upcycling blue spent grain and what this means is that we want to put people at the center of the circular economy so when we look at traditional models for circular food systems we find that they're obviously resource driven right so you have a waste you have a leftover resource and you're creating a new product from it and closing the loop but what about where do like the largest resource on the planet potentially people where do we fit into this model mm-hmm. and so we're trying to like build it on that and so currently we have our prototype in bangalore at this space called kutumba which is a community center initially started for women from marginalized communities there's a daycare they have porridge mix program they have a kutumba kitchen that they run and so the idea of us being there is to see how from what we do it can be either kind of like what are the synergies and where can we fit in and how can they fit into like what we're doing and what does that mean larger for the whole community space and for the people who come in and move out so that's a model they're currently building and i think the future the like how we see growing is that we definitely want to be able to upcycle more spent grain currently there's so many breweries in bangalore around india and i think there's so much potential to tap into it and we also want to look at creating new products but also creating new products that have more that are not just niche or which are not just niche and for like you know just for maybe an occasion but something maybe can spend green like become part of like if it's being produced in our city can it become part of our diet in a way you know can we also incorporate it in here somehow so yeah that's kind of you know how we're seeing growing space yeah so fantastic if you are in india please do check out the website and uh, order try out something i will be in india in december right now i'm in madrid so i'm, I'm going to definitely order and check it out fun there's some really exciting like food waste initiatives there uh, as well i remember reading about uh, a couple i should send you yeah please do please do send it to me they have a lot of so when we were in europe i think the food redistribution apps were really fun to use what what do you mean by food distribution apps my memory is failing me so you have these really cool systems where restaurants can sign up to you can log in as a customer and see uh, restaurants can basically list items that are maybe maybe things that they don't want to they want to sell that not really are spoiled yet but like things that they want to like get like sell off their inventory uh, and they they want to prevent them from going bad and they want you to buy it and they sell it at like a lower rate and so from all sorts of things i remember going crazy about like pastries as well when we travel like you'd get like half price for stuff like at the end of the day and like it's economical there's nothing wrong with the product it's just that they're going to make a fresh new batch the next day yeah and yeah it's good stuff if yeah there are, there are a couple of apps like this um Uh, too good to go is that too good to, uh, go, yeah. too good to go is great yeah um yeah and uh, and lots of like fun to then also if you can't choose a meal be like okay what's looking good <laughs> on here <laughs> so yeah yeah is, is that happening in india do you see or do you see it happening in the future it's so i remember like in bangalore there were a few food redistribution fridges that you know people had kept out for people to come and take i So going back to your problem of like accountability i think we still need to build like that system of trust uh, i mean i feel like uh, that system of trust has to be built within like restaurants and consumers there's still like a lot of you know you need to be you need to be sure that you know they they really they're not just selling you anything and i feel like because of lack of transparency in the system you know whether it's through food safety or things like that like the stories we hear about even uh, midday meals and like things like or like general kitchen raids and like you find horrible things in them like there's no certainty of the fact that like uh, people are being accountable for what they serve you and especially with this new like kitchen restaurant boom i think there's a lot of trust that needs to be built before people will start taking these things seriously i would think that restaurants that have a reputed name can definitely like do this within their customer circle i think it's definitely like an option but like for it as a general thing of like how to go to go does i guess then it's going to take some time great we will take a tiny tiny break and when we come back we will talk about your biggest pet peeve and your underrated overrated food items 
Let's take a tiny break. And we're back. And we've heard a lot of great things about saving grains. Now, Elizabeth, tell us your biggest pet peeve related to food. And and you can't say the same thing that you said earlier. New one. Hey, you didn't tell me that before. You're, you're a food researcher, <laughs> so you'll uh, you'll have a lot of pet peeves. I think one thing that I'm like trying to get over also, but trying to understand <laughs> is me being nice about things. Is this whole like plant based, like just the word like plant based? Oh, love it. And I just don't like. I can't. What does it mean in a way? But also like, how do you? understand it even for yourselves or like how do you sure okay it's made from plants but like you know it being superior like being better than something else or like even just generally like how it deflects away from certain existing things that we already have in like culinary like repertoire and like uh, just like what we we know how to do with it and I, it gives it a very skewed sense of what it really means because like it's still kind of whatever's being made is still part of like the industrial food system which is not bad like it's still feeding people but i feel like the way of how it it's like it tries to put on like a costume and (laughs) walk around like uh you know like it's something else and better uh but i think that's just like everything plant-based and you see it on like it's everywhere now it's on menus it's on billboards it's like on everything uh, that even this plant-based water also probably uh, it's just like ridiculous it's, it's ridiculous it is ridiculous and there's a self-righteousness associated with it which is very absolutely, annoying absolutely yeah. yeah like yeah. we have i think you'd know more about this but in india if somebody doesn't want to eat a meat biryani, we've had a kathal biryani, jackfruit biryani. So we've had, mm. we have rajma galauti, chana galauti. Yeah. We have uh, less synthetic or non-synthetic versions of popular meat dishes. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 there, it exists, it's natural. And like, I mean, what is natural again? But like, <laughs> but it's like, it's it's almost as bad as like these new, like different kinds of waters that we find at like the supermarket. I don't know. But yeah, I think they're just like, just that. Also the word like generally sustainability is starting to like kind of now because it's everywhere. And I also have myself have to say like I work because for people to understand what I do I have to say I have to work in food and sustainability and like like cringe each time but I feel like it's being just like used so much but again what does it mean who does it mean like yeah what does it mean to who um I think there's there's so much to explore there yeah. super and let's come to the last part underrated overrated and favorite so uh let's let's start with being nice uh, what are some underrated food items in your opinion underrated food items i i would say can i actually have the same answer for all <laughs> cheating that's cheating no has anyone had the same answer for all before i have the same answer underrated overrated and favorite you have all you have, I the have same all, answer for all and it's the idli <laughs> oh okay so and please tell us why it's underrated my overrated. my relationship with the idli goes back to a food science class in Calvary okay. school actually mm-hmm. it was my final paper as mm-hmm. my thesis in college and uh we had to like I worked on understanding what makes a good idli yeah we looked at things like viscosity we went to the dental materials lab to get like compression testing done which was fun uh we did over 16 batters so testing like ph and things like that but i think that like underrated because i feel like it's so core to so many like it checks so many boxes of how we want to approach a food today right we want something to be fermented and like have good gut health and it's steamed or like if it's like with nutritional elements like that or something that's affordable obviously because of the pds system but like also because and something so widely available so there's this whole like economic socio-economic element to it that makes it so like so functional and so integral to so many of like our diets here overrated because it gets too much time on twitter which is unnecessary <laughs> like i can't like every two weeks you're seeing somebody argue uh, about the idli 
and favorite because yeah i think there's no better way to start the day <laughs> and it can come in like all flavors and forms and except for those chocolate ones which are like weird <laughs> no <it's, laughs> the only sweet at the are meeting is with ghee and sugar but yeah i i think that i i feel like it's still the same like about um, like a, i mean like food is that like there's there's always a yes no and like a I may like this but yeah sorry it's a very That's, diplomatic answer but no no it's fascinating <laughs> it's fascinating how the same thing can be you can have two different feelings about the same thing very interesting yeah and i think on twitter bangor food twitter is uh, the dominant section of twitter that talks about it <laughs> a lot yeah i know it's yeah. like every every second day there's some like war going on and i'm like it doesn't need any more attention you've said your bit we know where you like your idli from <laughs> the chutneys yeah. look so good in in pictures i actually have idli for the chutneys honestly i mean that's i think a lot of people would agree with that really yeah yeah i don't know like there's so much again like understanding this is also very i mean this is also something that we try to do and like i really want to look more into is like flavor profiles of just like the food in itself you know like how things like work and and like how so when we we test out these different batters some like they fermented differently each time and we went back and asked the guy cuz you bought the same rice from the same shop so i was mm. like okay why is this different and he's like oh we we just sourced it from a different region so like do we think about terroir in like uh terroir and throwing big words there were like what is terroir what is terroir no yeah. <laughs> so basically it uh, i'm not going to like make one big definition and all of that but like for me terroir is like just understanding the natural environment in which something is grown and how that lends how that lends like maybe i guess characteristic whether it's through flavor or through structure to a particular ingredient and i feel like have we thought about like a terroir of any like we always think about it as another reason why it's underrated is because it's always seen as like a sidekick to a chutney or a sambar right and it's it should be like its own you know like it needs that you know like what does it mean on its own like kotte idli i could just like eat it like uh, idli steamed in jackfruit leaves um i could just like eat you can eat it like on its own because it's it's so good so it's like how do we also then look at foods in a way that we appreciating flavor I, i guess of of what's happening in there or like what does it mean for it to shape but anyway, i'm just rambling now which i don't do <laughs> yeah lots of pardon the cliche but food for thought <laughs> great i used to like your previous episodes there were so many like in initially there were like so many like puns in the title like it was so funny i remember like way back when you guys started though yeah yeah like about i can't remember anything now but yeah the titles were so fun <laughs> yeah we we will try to get back to that no i just yeah cool uh, this was fantastic elizabeth i learned a lot and uh, where can our listeners find you on social media i'm on elizabeth york on instagram but then edible issues for like food system news and saving grains for like all things upcycle so i guess twitter and instagram yeah fantastic aur hum karte hain dukan band if you like this podcast don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can listen to us on the ivm podcast app or ivmpodcast.com you can also follow us on our social media we are at the rate ivm podcast on twitter and instagram and if you want to reach out to me on twitter i am hussain sadaf1 and on instagram i am sadaf underscore hussain you can reach out to archit on twitter at the rate bandtofu and on instagram at the rate the hustling glutton